You're listening to the Anticlimactic Non Show with your host. And we're talking about the middle children of the HPE. The middle children of the HPE. Now, what is the HPE? The HPE is the human population explosion. The human population explosion is what I am going to begin calling the HPE. Now, the human population explosion occurred in the last 200 years. What happened was we went from 1 billion humans to 7 billion humans in 200 years between, shall we say, 1818 and today, right? Uh, now, that happened right in the middle of the 400 years of oppressive empire uh, that the Europeans went on. The thing where they just decided everybody else was heathens and animals and uh, <laughs> butchered and, and uh, enslaved millions. That's a thing, okay? And that's 450 years old now, and we're working on figuring out what, whatever. It's taken forever to decolonize both the world and our minds. And so that's about 450. And 200 years ago, in the middle of that, probably because of, or at least in part because of, developments by um, Western civilization, such as uh, sanitation. Uh, for that prevents disease and so on, or uh, also uh, you know vaccination, um, the idea of uh, being able to combat illness that would normally have killed us in the past, um, radical changes in modernity, um, all of this stuff is happening, and suddenly less of us are dying, and so uh, more of us are suddenly around. And that massive explosion of population, the HPE, right? We are middle children of the HPE. We are middle children of the human population explosion. And here uh, at this point, among all of you as middle children of the HPE, I feel less motivated by what I'm being sold, which is go make a bunch of money, be capitalist, be, uh, fight for things, uh, you know, and prevent others from taking. None of that motivates me as much as being philosophically and psychologically prepared for what humanity is going to be at, say, 10 billion. Uh, because what we've done is the globalists were right that by making it competitive, the population that was going like this would start to maybe, you know, people would have less children. The, the economies would change to economies where that wouldn't be the valued thing as much. Uh, that has happened in my lifetime, in the 20 years of my lifetime. But if that's the case, and what I've been saying for several years now, is we should just be prepared now for... 10 billion people. Now, if there's 10 billion people, what is the resource all allocation? And how do we go about thinking about sharing the materials we have now? And how are we sharing them now, for that matter? And are we mentally prepared for that? What I see instead, in the, especially recently, and in the United States of America, most Hollywood, the Western culture type of thing, is an apocalyptic vision that's all about killing off millions and accepting it um, from, you know, uh, sort of the very weird to me. It's very weird to me. I'm not Christian. I'm born a Hindu Tamil Brahmin, and I am an atheist. Uh, but I've studied various religions. I have a degree of familiarity. I think it's pretty good. I have read the Bible. Uh, but the idea of an apocalyptic ending as described there in which the rapture happens for the good and the bad are all killed all the way up to Thanos 
in Marvel, the comics movie, snapping his finger and and uh, fingers and and half the population of the universe disappears, seems to be almost about a preparatory state, almost like convincing people to commit apocalypse. Uh, so instead of doing what we ought to be doing, which is preparing for a world in which 10 billion exist, or mentally understanding what material value really is so that our footprint on the earth is minimized so more the more of us that do exist can coexist, or approaching um, how to make the resources of this world um, more lasting, Instead of doing that, a tremendous amount of energy of the Western thing seems to be directed toward apocalyptic visions and imagining over and over again the destruction of many millions. And when I ask myself about that, and I think about what white culture has asked me to do in the United States, white culture has been very clear to me, right? Dude, you're not black, you're not Mexican, <laughs> right? You're not Latino. You're an Asian, but you're from India, the opposite side of the earth. And our image of you is great at math, real smart, doctors. There's no predetermined imagery of you, right? Like when I arrive. Since that time, we've had Abu, the grocery store guy. We've had Patel Hotels. We've had a little bit of what, you know. But really, no. India remains on the other side of the earth, very separate from the United States of America. It's the largest democracy in the world. Uh, it has the highest number of people voting and voting honestly, you know, well, I mean, casting them at least. Uh, it's totally different culture from here in many, 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 many ways, though it's adopted a lot of the Americanisms like all, all the world has, right? Uh, and so what they told me was, dude, just buy in. That's all you have to do. Accept that the genocide of the natives is over. Accept that like we're in charge. Accept that like, yeah, we, we, were, we held slaves and stuff, but black people are, yeah, they pretty much can do what they want now. You know, like the, the constant like rap out of the mouths of the white supremacists, whether they are really actively white supremacists or they're just kind of privileged to the point of not knowing their own privilege. So they're so ignorant because they haven't really seen what it means to be black or Latino or look different or to feel um, uh, truly oppressed or invisible or uh, repressed or uh, held down. Of course, it's going to seem to them like, what do you mean? You would just work hard and you know play by the rules and you can have this too, is the thing, right? This kind of American dream. And I've not wanted that because I don't feel comfortable signing up. No, I had to, right? Why did I have to? Well, my parents moved here when I was two years old. I've been an American for 35, I've been an American longer than Arnold Schwarzenegger. I have worked hard to understand the history and politics of this country. I studied that in university and went to the University of Texas and I graduated with a degree in that area of study. I went and worked in politics, in policy. I helped elect a judge in Austin, Texas. He's still there, the judge that I helped elect. I was his campaign manager. Uh, I helped pass certain legislation in the Texas state legislature. I helped work on campaigns uh, for Governor Ann Richards, for example. Uh, then I left politics and got interested in international travel, journalism, and public health. I began studying the world. And instead of wanting to do policy, I wanted to write about it or make radio about it or do programming about it. So I began doing that for many, many years. Then I did my master's degree in demography and public health uh, with the intention of learning how to communicate good ideas about public security, safety, uh, health to large communities of people and to learn about demography, about what is going to happen. We're in this population, boom, I'm, in the, I'm, I'm the middle child of the human population explosion. I spent a lot of years studying this. Then I went to work for companies in various fields. Uh, I worked in the in uh, biotechnology for um, Genentech. I worked at uh, the New School in New York, uh, a, a social and cultural institution. I worked for a radio program, uh, well, in general, a radio production for a, a pacifist uh, entity, the Pacifica Foundation. Uh, I wrote a tremendous amount, millions of words, and, and published uh, short fiction and published uh, journalism. Uh, and as I was doing all of that, the net became what it is. And 
writing changed and news changed and cultures changing. I don't know how to produce today in a way that addresses this topic of being a middle child of this human population explosion, seeing the tech now advance to the point that it is, and wanting us to connect over what matters rather than uh, sell something or m make comedy, sell entertainment or make, you know, um, things that pitch an apocalyptic vision of the world. But I think that is my interest and pursuit to resist uh, the violent warmongering and apocalyptic visions and uh, cruel, I would say, uh, behaviors of capitalists who seize land and resources and power for those who would pay the most and to promote instead shared consciousness, uh, shared values of reducing one's uh, drain on resources and helping to equilibrate the sharing of them to those who have less. Uh, the end of war, a thing that I first wrote in the 90s, World Peace One, there it is on the wall. I, I'm looking for World Peace One. Uh, in 2003, this became manifest. My th my statement became manifest in a in the February 15, 2003 protests against the war. I call that World Peace One in a way. That was the first time in history that 15 million people all over the world, independent of each other, with different languages, cultures, everything, said no. We do not want you to attack Iraq right now. No to a, a global war uh, because again, the U.S. is over here. What is it? It's flying over there to conduct a thing on the basis of its uh, notions of security in the post 9-11 act uh, that was farcical and wrong and uh it's a quagmire and the endless war continues the illegal endless war continues um so a pacifist future is possible uh i know this to be true and we are capable of it um recently i was thinking about this and uh discussing it again with my friend, uh, Professor Burns. And he said, he, he reminded me of a Paul Eluard quote. He said, uh, there is another world, but it is in this one. And I think that's the direction we need to be headed. Um, and I hope that this program, the anticlimactic non-show, merely by existing and continuing the discourse, uh, can be something that achieves that. If someone in Sydney and Tokyo and Mumbai and London and New York and LA or San Francisco or whatever, and I could come here every day and discuss some of these things, I, I theorize it'll be useful. I theorize it'll be a way to make things better. Uh, and not just because I'll be sitting here talking, but obviously because people who agree and who want to discuss this and who want to take on the challenge of being um, proactive about the things that are going wrong in the world and to fight ignorance and to help educate people would want to turn to something like this and we can use it. I don't know. This is my thought. This is my very first ever attempt at live streaming, though again, I'm trained in radio. To speak of that war, 2003, I was in the United Nations at the Security Council on the eve of the bombing of uh, Baghdad. And in the morning, I was at the, the press crew. I mean, I was among the press crew, and I was the only person who, with my, when the mic came, I demanded that every secretary from each country answer the question, do you condemn the bombing of Baghdad? by the United States and British forces. I made them all answer. 
uh, Sergei Lavrov, I remember, looked right at me and he said, you would have all read what our you know, president said this morning. Putin says this definitely violates the UN Charter. You know, uh, I was the only journalist there representing peace. And that shouldn't have been that way. How is that possible? Uh, and since that time, it's gotten worse, to be honest. To be a pacifist in the United States is considered, it's like being a socialist or being a communist. You can't do it for some reason. And that's wrong. That's totally wrong. And against the founding of this country, uh, we've got to resist that. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that there are more of you out there. Okay, that's another 20 minutes. So let's